federal government is borrowing money at an astonishing rate. However, the interest rate is lower than the rate of economic growth. If that lasts, it's possible that the government can just roll over its debt, borrowing new money to pay interest on the old money. Debt will grow forever, but the economy will grow faster, so debt will fall relative to the size of the economy. Proponents of government spending cite this possibility as a justification for borrowing even more, and mostly to send money to people and businesses. Borrowing money, sending it to people, and never raising taxes to repay it is catnip to politicians' ears. And if the government doesn't have to pay back its debts, why should any citizens have to pay back our debts? Borrow and bail us out, too. Why should we work? Will it work? Or will big borrowing have to be followed by big taxes and big spending cuts if we're to avoid a big inflation, or worse, a really big debt crisis? The interest rate versus growth rate question is a fascinating technical debate for economic theorists. But we don't have to fight that debate, as the story simply doesn't apply to the actual U.S. fiscal situation. The U.S. is running regular primary deficits of 5% of GDP, and an extra 20% in each crisis. Then, a few years from now, Social Security and medical spending really explode deficits. Now, yes, if the interest rate is 1% less than the growth rate, and with debt at 100% of GDP, the U.S. can run deficits of 1% of GDP, but not 5 or 10%. Finding pennies in your couch won't buy that new car. Growing out of debt requires that taxes equal spending for a generation or two, while growth outpaces interest. But taxes equal to spending for decades would be a debt hawk's dream come true. The U.S. situation is an intractably exploding debt-to-GDP ratio. Steady, large deficits, not a slowly declining ratio with balanced budgets that we might bump to a higher level with a one-time expansion. Now, strong growth and low interest rates did help the U.S. to reduce debt relative to GDP following World War II. But the war and its big spending were over. The U.S. ran steady primary surpluses for two decades, not our steady deficits. And the experience was not painless. We had two big bouts of inflation and a major crisis in the early 1970s, which effectively wiped out a lot of debt. There was a lot of financial repression making you hold the debt. You couldn't buy stocks abroad or even change much currency. And the U.S. experienced 4% and more growth more than ever seen before in history, in a much more dynamic and less regulated economy, not the anemic 2% growth facing us now. One might say, let's ride the low interest rate bubble while it's here and fix it later if debt seems to cause trouble. But debt problems do not resolve quietly and predictably. Too much debt results in either sharp inflation, crushing taxes, and sharp and deep benefit cuts, or in a chaotic debt crisis, which would be a financial catastrophe. The end comes quickly and unexpectedly. Markets smell a crisis coming. They charge higher interest rates. Higher interest rates worsen the deficit, and that makes the crisis arrive even faster. And unlike Greece and Italy, there's no Germany to come bail out the U.S. Solving the U.S. fiscal problem is not that hard. Simple reforms of our chaotic tax system can produce much more revenue with less economic damage. Simple reforms of our entitlements can direct money to people who need it much more effectively. Strong pro-growth policies would produce much more revenue and less spending. Most of all, Congress and the administration must stop spending as if money can be printed or borrowed with no consequence and return to spending money as if taxpayers actually have to pay for it, either now or later, because they do.